Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another UFC fight prediction video. In this video, I'll be predicting the full card of fights for UFC 266, Volkanovski versus Ortega. So without further ado, let's get to our first fight on the card. So in our first fight, we have in the featherweight division, Omar Morales versus Jonathan Pierce. And how I see this one right here is um, Pierce is a solid dude, comes with good pace, good conditioning, good cardio, solid wrestling, pretty decent striking as well. And Omar Morales on his side presents some pretty solid wrestling. Well, not as active with his wrestling is, you know, could have better, ser better served him in his career so far. But not only got one loss, that was to Giga Chikaza, so you can't really knock him too much. But you would like to see the guy use his wrestling more. He definitely has it, but doesn't use it as much. And I'm not saying he's you no know, super stellar wrestler or anything standout-ish, but anytime you can mix it up, it's always beneficial. Better than, like, relying on one thing. But, you know, sometimes um, Jack of all, not Jack of all trades, but one time's, uh, specialists, like a lot of times specialists do thrive, but all I'm saying, I feel like he can definitely benefit from using wrestling a little bit more, but doesn't use it. But to get to the get to the point with this prediction, a lot of stuttering and bumps here, starting out with this video, but we're going to keep riding with it, keep rolling with it. But how I see this fight really is, I think Morales has the wrestling to keep us on the feet. I don't feel like Pierce will be able to have great success with his wrestling, whether it be taking him down even harder to hold him down. I feel like Morales is the be has proven to be the better striker. Pierce will be have a little bit of a speed advantage, but I feel like Morales will have a technical and a strength advantage and a power advantage. And I feel like on the feet, he'll just land the heavier, harder shots, probably land more shots, whereas Pierce probably land some less significant shots, a, a bit of volume, but it's going to be clear that Morales is landing the heavier shots. And he's going to probably be the one in control of whether this fight goes to the ground or not. I feel like Pierce is probably going to be going for it more, but I feel like Morales should be able to address it and maybe even get some wrestling offense of his own off. But ultimately, I see this as like a decision fight, but I feel like Morales' power, strength, and technical advantage in the striking and ability to keep this standing or take it to the ground will lean on Morales to get a decision victory. So in this one, I have Omar Morales via decision. Now to our next fight we have in the welterweight division, Matt Samelsberger versus Martin Sano. And how I see this one right here. So I looked back on Martin Sano, and I was not impressed at all with his fights. I don't know what he's been doing since. Like he hasn't fought in a while, and his prior fights weren't all that great. He's like a soft body guy with very questionable wrestling defense, not the best grappling, striking, nothing to write home about at all. So, and he's four and two and one. So it's not like he has an impressive record. Maybe he's been training. Maybe he beat somebody up in the gym. And they said, oh, "This guy's improved so much. Like you got to give him the UFC. He's gonna shine under the bright lights." And maybe he does. Sometimes that happens. These guys either come to the UFC and look mediocre. They've been out for four years. Also, they come back. They looking like a whole new man. Sometimes guys just be middle of the pack, be lost to the wayside, drifting down the cracks until they get a UFC opportunity. All of a sudden they come to UFC and they thrive. So it could be a case. That's like, where am I concerned with? But ultimately, I'm leaning to Matthew Melberg, and I don't really see that being the case. I think it's going to be a case that he's going to come in and be who he is. He might be able to eke around and win some other fights, but I don't see him having a very long life in the UFC, if not just losing this one and being out. And I do see him losing this one. I feel like Offensively and defensively wrestling don't really bring much to the table. Yeah, I don't see him bringing anything to the table. I feel like Samoberger, bigger, stronger, better striker, much better wrestler, probably better grappler as well. I don't really see Sano bring anything for him. I just think Matt Samoberger, the steam rolls right through him. He might come out here cautious, you know, because like, you don't know what this guy's been doing and why he even here or why he even belong here. But I feel like he's going to gonna take a little bit of a caution maybe for the first two minutes, then just run right through him. Whether it be taking him down and just run like this ground and pounding him out or just knock him out on the feet. So in this one, I have Matt Samelsberger via first round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in the middleweight division, Nick Maximov versus Cody Brundage. And how I see this one right here. So um this is a fight between two guys that don't really got the most tape on them, don't really got the most experience. You got like a guy who definitely is a wrestler in Brundage. You got Maximov, who's also a wrestler, but has been training with the Diaz brothers for a long time, one of their protégés, one of their prodigies or whatnot. And like, it's still like a lot to be looked at, a lot, a lot that needs to be seen from this Maximov. So it's not like you can really judge too much on what you've seen from him or Brundage. But if, I feel like i got a better judge of what Brundage can bring than what I feel like Maximov could bring. Maximov didn't really show all that much in his fight on the contender series. He fought a heavyweight. And I feel like he always probably been a middleweight or weltweight, but I don't know. He just came took an opportunity up a weight class or up a couple weight classes. But yeah, it's... Saw some decent technique, but wasn't super all too impressed with him. Brundage, I was decently impressed with him against William Knight, but still showed like very look, very much one dimension. Like his wrestling can be powerful, but 
then showed me that against the high level fighter for three rounds. I mean, he got caught so he didn't get the opportunity. He was going for a takedown, got hit with those Travis Bounds elbows, and he got knocked up. Up to that point, he was looking pretty decent, looking pretty solid, but was looking pretty much one dimensional. Maximov, from what I seen, like he's is a much more well rounded fighter. He wrestling background, got some high level BJJ as well, and then some solid boxing as well, where Brunish is just uh, a wrestler. And I feel like Maximov, with his wrestling background, can you know, he can address Brundage wrestling to a decent standard. I think Brundage is definitely the best wrestler, but I feel like Maximov can address his wrestling. And on top of that, he can throw them with submissions and throw them with things that Brundage necessarily can't. I feel like Brundage does train jiu-jitsu, but not to the extent that Maximov has been training jiu-jitsu. And on top of that, I feel like wrestlers typically going to get tired when things aren't just going their way, when they can't just lay on you and it's a hard struggle to get you down unless you're, they're in that top 1% of wrestlers. So I feel like Brundage is going to might have some decent success early, but ultimately he's going to start to wear on him. Maxwell's pressure and pace gonna start to wear on him. The submission attempts gonna wear on him. And I think eventually Maxwell starts to walk him down after that first round, tag him up, get him to shoot bad shots, threaten him with chokes, take advantage of positions off those um those choke attempts or submission attempts, and then, then take the position as a ground and pound him, wear him out. Then in that third round, he has a tired runnage, tags him up, force him to take a shot, snaps his neck down, take take his back, and chokes him out via rear neck and choke. So in this fight, I have Nick Maximoff be a third round submission. Now to our next fight, we have in the lightweight division, Uros Medich versus Jalen Turner. So you got two talented up and coming fighters rising up this division. You got um Medich versus Turner. You got like 6'3", like, 6'4", six, six, Turner versus 6'1", Medich. Two very long, lanky lightweights. Two fighters that I would say more are in the striker department, definitely Medich. Turner's a little bit more well-rounded, but still I would say very much in the striker department. But I see this one right here. It's, um, I feel like... This is Medich fights to win. And I'm predicting predicting Medich to win this one. I feel um that Turner. No, he has the length. And um he has some pretty good hands, pretty good kicks. But I feel like he does kind of fall in love with the hands a little bit. And I feel like when and also he doesn't put as much power behind the shots as Medich does. So I feel like the power, I feel like Medich had a little bit more snap in his shots and those kicks, and he a bit of mix, he he does mix it up more. And I feel like with a Turner's long frame and long body, the already powerful kicks of Medich gonna be put a intensified in a way. I'm are gonna be more em emphasized in a way because Turner has that long body, and when you get kicked and dug into that long body, they can't wear it as well because they cut it all that weight to make 155. Like they're like 6'4 making 155, 6'3 making 155. So I feel like Medich is gonna notice that coming in. And he already looks for that kick. I just think he's not gonna go crazy for it and telegraph it. He's going to look for it. It's going to be like a filling out process in the first round, very tight first round. Then the second round, Medici is going to look to, to really go for that body, really start to you know, take advantage of what he saw in the first round and studied in the first round about Turner or learn from Turner in the first round. And then really start to, to mix it up and slam heavy body kicks in low, heavy body shots, touch him with a jab to the body, straight to the body, and like, you know, really fill that body out and sneak in those mid-level, those body shots in there. And I feel like Turner, that's going to really start to wear on Turner immediately, immediate effect on Turner in that second round. And then from that point, I feel like Medich is going to be in a full, Medich is going to be in a fully in the driver's seat. You're going to have a weathered Turner in the third round. I feel like uh, Medich will put him away probably mid part of that third round. So in this one, I have Oro Medich via third round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have in the women's flyweight division, Roxanne Matafari versus Talia Santos. And how I see this one right here. So I see this fight look, looking very similar to the Viviana Rajo fight, to be honest. And I feel like Matafari can evolve, I mean, improve from that fight. She did, that was like her last fight. And I feel like this is definitely not a fight where you can rock, write Matafari out. So that's why I'm not putting it in as a lock pick. This is a high high confidence pick, but not a lot because Tyler Sandra is still not the most proven fighter. She's only got one loss. Not the best opponent, but and Roxanne Matafari has been known to pull off these upsets. So you can't really lock in on Talia Santos just yet. I mean, you can bet on her, but you can't be like, oh, without a shadow of a doubt, she's going to win this one because still a lot to be proven. But I feel in this one, Talia Santos is the better striker, without a doubt. Got to worry about her cardio and p pacing. It's not like she has bad cardio, bad pacing, but still got to be worried about that. We'll go to somebody like Matafari. Matafari can definitely take you there and take you out of your element or make you work harder and then look to drain you, drag you to the ground and just school you. But the Tyler Santos, they stay sharp, stay fresh the whole fight, or at least through the two rounds and most of that third round and not get submitted or TKO. But she got like pretty high level BJJ as well. So she should be confident there. Should be safe. I mean, not safe, but should be comfortable enough there with grappling modifier. Just don't want to be on bottom. That's all. So if she's on top, cool. Taking her down, cool. On top, cool. But on bottom, nah. 
But I feel like Tyson is faster. She's a harder hitter. She's a more technical striker. She's a stronger fighter. So I feel like she should be able to keep the fight on the feet and control the position, just like Arajo did. And she's faster, sharper, stronger, hits harder, more tactical, and all that stuff. And like I said, she'll be to keep us on the feet, dictate the pace, dictate the, um, where they're at, land the hard strikes, land more strikes, and just really dictate this fight. And I, Modifari is a tough chick. She can definitely take some damage and wear some damage and go through three rounds. I don't feel like Talisana is going to be to put her out. Sano does pack a mean punch, but I don't think she will put her out. And I see this fight going to a decision. So in this one, I have Talia Santos. Via third round, not third round, <laughs> via decision. I don't know why I was going with that. But again, Talia Santos, via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the heavyweight division, Shamil Abdurakhimov versus Chris Dawkins. And how I see this one right here between Abdurakhimov and Chris Dawkins? How do I see this one? I feel like Shamil Abdurakhimov is a pretty solid guy. I wouldn't rate his wrestling all that crazy, but it's definitely something to worry about. Got some solid power, definitely something to worry about. But I just feel like with his style of wrestling, his style of striking, and his style in general, he's just going to walk right into the punches of Chris Dawkins. Chris Dawkins is faster, sharper, right down the pipe type of striker. Abdurahimov is kind of like a winging, looping type of striker in most cases. In most cases, not all cases, in most cases. And most of his takedowns aren't like he's going to do blast double. It's going to be upper body takedowns or at least body lock and stuff like that, which is going to walk him right into punches. And I just see Chris Dawkins is chewing him up and... Abdurahimov walking right into Chris Dawkins' punches while Chris Dawkins is really having to set too much up and just put him in the chainsaw, put him in the butcher shop and just chopping him up as he tried to come right in, straight down that line with the straighter, sharper, faster punches. Touching Abdurahimov, uh, touching Abdurahimov early and often and, and put him out in that first round. So in this fight, I have Chris Dawkins via first round TKO. Now to our next fight, we have... In our prelim co-headliner, I guess, I don't know if that's a thing, but this, our pre- second fight to the last on our prelim, we have in the lightweight division, Dan Hooker versus Nasrat Hakparaz. And how I see this one right here, I feel like, um, in this one right here, I don't really feel like Hakparaz brings anything that Hooker hasn't already seen before. I feel like somebody said, um, he kind of, he has the same stuff, some of the same tools that Chandler has, but he don't have the rest that Chandler had. One of the main reasons that Chandler's hook worked on, um, Hooker was because Chandler is such an explosive fighter, much more explosive than Hawk Ross. That's one thing. Then on top of being explosive, short and stocky. That's another thing. Then on top of that, explosive fight wrestler that can blast double leg, you blast you off your feet, scoop you up and just body slam you. Like a very explosive high level wrestler. Hawk Ross ain't that level of wrestler. He ain't that explosive. He don't got as much power. Don't got as much experience. And his he don't disguise his wrestling as well as with his striking. Like it's just not the same level, but if he can do it, he can do it, but I, I'm not going to bank on it, and I'm picking Hooker in this one. I feel like Hooker's length will be a problem. I don't feel like Hawker Ross' defense is all that great. And I, feel, I don't feel like his offensive strike, I don't feel like his striking is as tight, so I feel like Hooker can definitely sneak some knees up there, and Hooker could even do that against the best people. So, And it's not just because Hawker Ross isn't that tight. I mean, he's not that tight with his striking. I'm not saying striking isn't good, but he's not as tight as you would want him to be against a fighter like Hooker who looks to take advantage of those gaps and those openings with stepping knees or a little sneak the knee up there when you're coming in. So I feel like Hooker will be able to use his length. And Hooker really, in a way, is like might be the most dangerous guy in his division through maybe, what, first two rounds. Like matter of fact, I might say at this given point in the 155 division, striking-wise, through like the first two rounds, well, maybe Conor McGregor, but Conor McGregor, who has Conor McGregor done in recent years? Nothing. So in the, in the what, one, two rounds, strikers in the lightweight division, at this given moment, Hooker has proven to be, in recent years, the most dangerous guy in one or two, one or two rounds. It's kind of like that third, fourth, and fifth. Really, a fourth and fifth when he started to fade and become a punching bag. Like against Felder, or against Poirier. But first two, three rounds, one to three rounds, probably the most dangerous guy striking-wise in the lightweight division. So I feel like Hawker Ross, we, we try to look, try to close that gap. But I feel like Hooker will be the, you know, walk him in the shots, be long, keep that distance. And ho- just keep walking Hawker Ross into knees, punches. And then uh, I think he gets him out in the first round. I'm saying all this to say all that. But I think he gets him out in the first round. I think he's able to keep him at bay, tag him up, make him have to get make him overcommit and try to close that gap after tagging him up early in that first round. And then later on in that first round, Hawk Rock's gonna try to overly aggressively close that gap, probably get hit with a step and knee, and then get hit with a combo barrage of punches and put out in the first round. So in this fight, I have Dan Hooker via first round TKO. Now to our prelim headliner, we have in the Bantamweight division, Marlon Marias versus Marab Davalishvili. 
And how I see this fight between Marais versus Davalish Vili. I said this in a quick pick, and I'm gonna say this in the full car prediction. I just feel like um this fight heavily results on I mean rise on momentum for me. Marais is still a solid dude, he's still a beast, but Chen is definitely fading, and people are definitely seeing that. I think Henry Cejudo kind of exposed, I mean, he already had always had cardio, so it's not like Cejudo exposed that necessarily, but he exposed even more so that he had cardio issues and more people started to take advantage of his cardio issues, but cardio issues, pacing issues, but questionable chin and not riding the best streak. So he's not looking the best when Rob DeBolish Billy is looking the best he's ever looked. Striking looking better every single fight. Wrestling always a problem. Probably, I'm going to say, out of everybody in the UFC right now, maybe in UFC history, this guy has the most wrestling cardio of anyone, regardless of TRT, C EPO, CPO, in MMA, in UFC MMA history. Maybe. I might be going crazy with the MMA history. There's been some guys with some cardio, card, crazy cardio like Clay Guida. Matter of fact, Clay Guido has probably the best cardio in UFC history. But as of right now, Davalish really has the best cardio in UFC actively. So, in best wrestling cardio. That man's wrestling cardio is insane. But either way, with this one, I feel it rides heavily on momentum. Yes, Marais has solid takedown defense and he's a solid striker. I'd probably say the more um, well rounded, fleshed out fighter. But momentum. And the Billy can press the pace. And if you got cardio, questionable cardio, the volatility will expose you and make you pay for having questionable cardio. Who will make you want to run five extra laps every single day, every single training camp, but probably afterwards, but who knows? By the way, I feel like heavily on momentum. I feel like when Rob the Devalis Billy will be able to stay up underneath Mar Marais, constantly struggling with takedowns, constantly struggling with press with pressure, pace constantly in his face, constantly look for takedown, and never give him Marais that ability to have a breather. I feel like Marais will look quite decent for one round, but I eventually think once Davalis Billy starts to get Marais looking for the takedown, I think Davalis Billy starts coming over top, touch him on that soft chin. I don't think he's going to knock him out, but I definitely think he's going to get him to feel it, put the buckle his knees a little bit, then score a takedown. And then from there, when he starts getting those takedowns consistently, I just feel like it's going to be a you know downhill from there. I just think he's going to start getting takedowns, getting control, landing ground and pound, and having control time with these takedowns. Probably like really in the second round. First round probably be limited control time, but heavy pressure, heavy pace, lots of attempts, maybe one or two scored, but mostly not securing these takedowns. Yeah, not securing these takedowns, but really making Marais work. Second round, more success, but also finding that shot over the top when Marais has, you know, really got, you know, looking for a takedown. He's going to get caught with a hit with a shot over the top. And then from that point, I didn't think it was going to be a downhill from there once some Rob Devilish crack him, score a takedown. Hurt him on the, like he hurts him on the feet, cracks him, and now he don't know what's coming. He don't know if it's a shot coming over the top or a takedown, and he don't know how to react. Chin's rocked. He's saying double. And the all ability is going to be on top of him, smother him, and really testing his endurance and testing his, testing his ability to grind. And I think from that point, the ability really just clearly grinds him out for the final two rounds. Close first round, maybe goes to Marais, but second and third, without doubt, go to Devalish Billy. Maybe even a 10 8 within those rounds, or maybe two 10 8s. So in this fight, I have Marab Devalish Billy. Via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the women's flyweight division Jessica Andrade versus Cynthia Cavillo. In high seat is one between Andrade versus Cavillo. I feel like um Cavillo will bring an interesting test to Andrade in a way, but I just don't feel like she, she's gonna really be able to bring. It. I feel like Andrade is expecting Cavillo to grapple. I don't feel like striking wise Cavillo really has anything for Andrade. So I feel like it'll be a case maybe early Cavillo might have some success, limited success. But even then, ultimately, I just feel like Andrade's going to, you know, get a feel for a takedown, get a feel for a strike, and then start to stuff her takedowns relatively easily. Start to walk her down, tag her to the body, tag her up top, bust her up, not give her the space to breathe. Maybe get a finish, but I feel like it's going to be a, a decision victory. Because Cavillo, she's a tough girl, and also she's going to be looking to mix up. She's not going to be just striking. She's going to fight to the end. But she's going to be out there just turning into a punching back. First round look good. We want Andrade to start to walk her down. Start to, she starts to feel Andrade's power and pressure. It's going to start to wear Cavillo down. And from there, it's going to be all Andrade. So maybe your first round might go Cavillo, but I'm really going to predict in all three rounds to Andrade. But ultimately, I feel like the, the final round, like if the fight goes on, it'll only get better for Andrade. And definitely the second round and third will be Andrade's rounds. So in this fight, I have Jessica Andrade via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the heavyweight division, Curtis Blades versus Jarzino Rosenstruck. And how I see this fight between these two, I feel like... um. Rosa Struck definitely brings some dangerous threats to Curtis Blades in this one. As we also seen Curtis Blades history, like doesn't do that well against on a one-dimensional fighters in a way. Derek Lewis is just a knockout artist. Curtis Blades is not, I mean, Derek Lewis is just a knockout artist. Francis Ngannou is just a knockout artist. Even though he did get that takedown on 
stupid mouth tricks. But so far, and he did get a submission in, in the fight, but either way, kind of one dimensional fighter than Derek Lewis and um Francis Gano, but heavy power. And you got Jardina Rhodes, right? Definitely kind of in that one dimensional category, high level striker, definitely knockout power, crazy knockout power. Probably the third hardest hitter in this division at the moment. So he lost to the probably the first hardest hitter. Maybe that's Derek Lewis, maybe that's Ngano. Maybe the second one, that's maybe that's Derek Lewis, maybe that's Ngano. And now the third hardest hitter in the division, Jarzino Rosenstruck. So kind of a pattern. Maybe he will land that knockout. But either way, I just feel like I'm going to lean to Curtis. Matter of fact, I'm going to lean to Curtis Blades in this one. I feel like Jarzino doesn't have as much tools. And it's not, he's not as, um, one, he's not as powerful as Ngano. Like Ngano can just, just if he can see your takedown. He can just basically just, just nullify your takedown relatively easy because he's just so strong, got such good strong hips. If he can see you, he can time you and his just shut your takedown off like it's nothing. Like he's very strong, especially early with his takedown defense. Derek Lewis is unpredictable. Rosenstruck isn't as unpredictable. That's the thing. I, I feel like Ngano just is force of nature. Derek Lewis is just so unpredictable and sneakily good at it's sneakily sharp. And it's sneakily exposed. Like really in general, Derek Lewis is just sneaky. And Blaze was you know, telegraphing his shots. Rosenstruck. I feel like he could capitalize on the, the um, telegraphing of a shot, but Jardino Jar on the other side, he telegraphed some of his strikes. Like, he, you know he's going to do it. When you pressure, you know he's going to do a check hook. When he's active, you know he's going to switch stance, throw a hit. Like, you know what he's going to do in most cases. So, if you, just like, I'm not saying he's a real gone. I said it's the same thing in a quick pick. But Curtis Blaze, you know what somebody's going to do. It's better to freeze him up. And Curtis Blaze has more tools than Rosenstruck in a way. Rosenstruck has all these striking tools, well, a couple limited striking tools and no real offensive grappling. Curtis Blaze has limited striking as well. But he also has wrestling. And I feel like he can draw out the counter strikes from Rolling Struck, then look to level change and score takedowns, or just keep him busy, keep him reacting, just touch him, use his limb, keep him at the end of his punches. Not really, though, too much that Rolling Struck can really counter effectively. Don't overcommit. So, he, like I said, that check is not there. You're not overcommitting that check is not really going to be there as much or to as much significance. And he started throwing feints, he started throwing shots out of this. He's filler shots, draw out his stuff, his feints, then look to. Get body locks in his cage and drag him to the ground. But Jarzino's tough. I feel like it's going to be a case where Curtis Blades may mix up, tie him up, drag him to the ground, but still a pretty close fight. I feel like he's going to be tag Blades at points, and Blades going to be had to battle through, show heart, show adversity. Uh, show heart to battle through adversity. And Rose Struck going to use his awkward grappling, wrestling defense. Like he's, I don't know. Matter of fact, I think he's going to get held down when he get taken. I thought it would be a case he get be popping back up. Maybe through the first round, maybe here and there, but I thought I think for the most part when Blades gets down, he'll be able to hold him down. Because Blaze is very solid on top. I mean, it takes much more. You got to be super strong like Derek Lewis or have some solid BJJ artists, some solid wrestling. And I don't think Rosenstruck has either of those. So I feel like in the case where Rosenstruck will have his moments, but for the most part, I feel like Blaze will be able to freeze him up, get his timing, tie him up and drag him to the ground and eke out a decision over him. Not the prettiest, but I feel like it will be pretty clear. So in this one, I have Curtis Blades via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in the middleweight division, Robbie Lawler versus Nick Diaz. And how's this one between Lawler versus Diaz? I feel like um, it's going to be a lot like the first fight, to, to be honest with me. I feel like, well, maybe not. I'm, I'm, I'm going a little bit. That's 17 years ago. A lot has changed, but a lot has remained the same. It's not going to be the same, but I think the same man will win. And I think it's going to be like a decision victory. I don't know if I predicted submission or, I mean, submission or finish. Another one, but matter of fact, it's going to be a decision. It's not only going to be a stoppage, I think it's going to be a finish. With Robbie Lawler's current style, it's definitely a style where it's going to be hard to really materialize a finish against him. One, he got crazy power still. Not as crazy as it once was. Not as unpredictable as he once was. But still got crazy power. And his style, he rolls with a lot of shots. He'll go into that shell. So you can't really hit him with the cleanest of shots. You could hit, you could touch him all you want for the most part. But you can't hit him with the clean finishing shots. And when you start over committing, that's when he'll land his counters. But you're constantly just touching him with filler shots. You could touch him with filler shots all day. Maybe mixing some power shots here and there, but still, it's when you overcommit, when he starts to take advantage of you overcommitting, then he starts to land his powerful counters that can knock you out. So I feel like with Diaz, he typically is a guy that, and the Diaz brothers in general, they're typically guys that throw a bunch of, you know, touch you shots. It's not the heavy shot. It's not the one big shot. Constantly just slapping you in your face, touching you, and just peppering you up. They're not going to, so it's never a case where they're really overcommitting with anything. They do have their hands low, so you can maybe catch them with a check hook, which Lawler might be able to do, but they got chin and they get hurt. They just go into their guard. And most people don't want to play with that. And Lawler probably not going to either. He might go for it, but still. 
it might be a moment like that in the fight, but ultimately I feel like the story of this fight is going to be Diaz constantly just touching up Lawler. Lawler constantly been in that shell, rolling with shots and trying to look for big shots. And then Diaz has been nowhere to be found, leaning out the way of the big hook and, and catching him with his own hook and then keep tapping him and, and put him back on the back foot and just keep constantly peppering up men in his face, probably holding his hands out like, what? What you want to do? What you want to do? Slapping him a couple of times, keep touching him, keep touching him. Evade, counter, touch, touch. And I feel like that's going to be rinse, repeat, the story of the fight. Maybe at moments, Lawler might try to go for a takedown or try to overcommit. Then Diaz might catch him in a Muay Thai clinch, throw a knee or threaten him with a choke or something or threaten him with submission. Or maybe Lawler might be hurt and go for a panic wrestling. But either way, I just feel like it'll be a case where really most of the fight is going to be Diaz just constantly touching him with these filler shots, constantly tagging him, constantly pincing him and beating him to a decision. So in this one, I have Nick Diaz via decision. Now to our next fight, we have in our co-main event, in the women's flyweight division, Valentina Shevchenko versus Lauren Murphy. And how I see this fight between lucky Lauren Murphy and Shevchenko, just flat to the point, no reason to even drag it out. Murphy's a tough chick. She's definitely been lucky on his way, like skilled and lucky on his way. She beat a couple people that people didn't really expect her to beat, find a way to win these close decisions. But nonetheless, she made it here. But all that been said, she's made it here. Kudos to her. People know her name now and not going to get confused like what Daniel Cormier was doing, but she's here now, but I just feel like Shevchenko is just literally better than every year. Faster, sharper, more technical. Probably a better grappler, to be honest. MMA grappler. Probably can take her down, get more takedowns on her, control position on her, maybe even tap her out. But Murphy has been proven to be a pretty tough chick, so I feel like she'll be the last couple rounds. I feel like she'll get put out in the third round, probably by TKO. But I feel like mostly those first two rounds, Shevchenko won't, won't be there to be hit, just be tagging her, butchering her, spinning kicks, body kicks, leg kicks, switch kicks. Spinning head kicks, spinning heel kicks, like just touching with every single kick. And it's been like five steps ahead of her. Just too fast, too sharp, too good. And Murphy just looking stiff and lost out there, getting bust up. And that third round, I feel like she would look for that kill shot when she started to have a, a, you know, a wounded deer, a wounded animal in front of her. Have her send double. Then look for that kill shot, maybe like a switch kick up top. Like, you know, fake low, come up top with a head kick, hurt her. And then pile some shots on and knock her down, and finish her with some ground and pound in that third round. So in this fight, I have Valentina Shevchenko via third round TKO. Number to our main event, we have in the featherweight division, for the undisputed featherweight title, we have Alexander Volkanovsky versus Brian T-City Ortega. How I see this one between these two? I feel like um, Ortega definitely presents some interesting challenges to Volkanovsky. I think that really the most interesting thing he presents to him is not his grappling. His grappling is definitely an effect, I mean, a factor in why he's so interesting against Volkanovsky. But I really think it's the unpredictability of Ortega. I feel like with people like Aldo, Aldo so fast, so explosive, but it can be predictable. Holloway so such a great boxer, such great cardio, such well-rounded, such this, such that, such amazing. But um, can be predictable. Like he definitely likes the jab, definitely likes the box. And when a box is like the inside lead, the inside leg kick is such an effective tool against him. So it's something you could do against them to, you know, nullify them or to a tool to deal with them, or at least to frustrate them or take advantage of them in a way. Hollywood, Otto has such amazing reflexes, but if you can draw out those reflexes, you can you know, make him confused about his reflexes and he's just making him re um, react to everything. So like people, these people are so amazing, but they also have pre were predictable. Ortega, you know, he can be predictable in a way, but also he's still very much unpredictable. Because like he's just a guy that all he's all he looking to do is drag you to the ground and some issue. It's like half and half, or maybe even more. He got more knockouts than submission, at least in the UFC. A lot of these fights, he be down, can't really get it to the ground. Like maybe there was the um, more counter fight. It was like behind the whole fight, they eventually broke more counter down, forced McConnell to shoot an uh, ugly shot and snapped a guillotine on him. Then it was other fight, you know, the last fight early on. Like Clay, I think Clay Guida was out striking and was dropping him and stuff, and he knocked Clay Guida out with like some stepping knee or something. So it's like. Ortega is not just a guy that's looking for the submission. He, he is a guy that is just fighting, and, and you know he takes advantage of what materializes. He never gives up, never quits. Same with Volkanovski. I mean, Volkanovski not like is proven of a finisher at this level, but he's a guy that gonna you know, keep working and, and battle through adversity and stay professional throughout. Like he don't no quit in him. Very professional and very tunnel vision out there. He's not a guy that's gonna get lost and sidetracked. So both these guys can have a similar thing. That's make it interesting. Like Ortega is not going to be as predictable. Like he might do a front kick, he might do a flying knee, and he's not going to be afraid to get taken to the ground. He's not going to care to get taken to the ground because he feels like he's good there, he's solid there. He wants you to take him to the ground. He wants to threaten with submissions. Probably show some new wrinkles in his jiu jitsu. 
that we haven't seen because he hasn't been that active. So it's a lot of stuff. He hasn't been that active. He's improving. His striking improved a leaps and bounds in his last fight. So it's like a lot to, you know, don't really know about a lot of stuff that's a mystery that's going to come out in this fight. And that makes him a very dangerous guy. First, he's already unpredictable. And now he hasn't been that active. So it's more unpredictably in him. And he already got some sneaky elbows. That's very dangerous for a short guy like Volkanovski. He likes to come in in crowded space. Could time with an elbow. Could time him with a knee. Spin an elbow. And then threaten with chokes, threaten with this. But yeah, attack is definitely going to be dangerous. But all that being said, I'm going to lean with Alexander Volkanovski in this one. I just feel like you got to give him respect. And like, he's been in B Holloway twice out there. One of the better strikers. Probably the best, well, one of the best strikers in the division. Probably one, if not two, best striker actively in the featherweight division. And he beat Holloway twice. I feel like he'll have the wrestling advantage in good, like, you know, by a good margin. So he can control whether the fight goes to the ground or not. I do feel like Ortega's submission skills are very, or at least his dangerous areas are very limited, like front head chokes and like triangle chokes. So like guillotines, darces, and triangle chokes. And yeah, that's like what stuff is good for him at all levels. But um, as far as like back taking, I don't have seen the great success at the highest level, like at back taking or controlling the back. Like yeah, Holloway couldn't really do nothing with Holloway. Holloway like, yeah, I'll just stay calm and composed and I just turn into him and not this completely nullify his um back control game. So yeah, his takedown offense isn't the greatest. Back taking not the greatest at this level. So really, like he kind of had, you know, he had the strengths, strong areas. And I feel like Volkanovski can definitely keep him from all those areas without much issue. Like he can stop the takedowns to a great degree. And should be able to give back up pretty good, pretty easily, or without much issue. He got no neck, so you can't really the front choking him not gonna be the easiest task. Finding his neck gonna be a very hard task. He's a short barrel neck little guy, so it's gonna be hard to find that. Trying to get arm submissions or anything already. They're trying to lock up the triangle choke on him. It's gonna be hard. He's already tight and compact. All he gotta do is squeeze his shoulder together, and that triangle choke, choke is nullified. And all he just see it coming, get tight, and then pass your legs to the side and pass the side control or yeah, or to sit up. Like it just sit right out of these submissions. So I feel like he can definitely neutralize a lot of Ortega's strength. And really, that's probably going to be part of his game plan. Volkanovski is an amazing game planner, or maybe his gym is an amazing game planner for him. But yeah, he has an amazing game plan, so I feel like he go out there. Probably one of his things going to look to put Ortega where he feels he's best, or at least to the ground where people expect him. Oh, he, on the ground, he's better. But if I take him there, stay in his guard, stay tight, land on the pound, and control, I take it to the ground. I control when it goes to the ground. Then that takes away that element for Ortega. Ortega might try to take advantage of it, when you're in control and you know what tools somebody's bringing, you could take them there, then you could really nullify them in their strongest area. Like, I know you good on the ground, but I can stay in the guard, stay tight, land some body shots, stay tight, knowing you are got a good time over your triangle chokes, got a good feel for things. I put you in a place at a time I want you to be in a place, so I know what you're about to do. So I'm already two steps ahead of you before you even try to attempt a submission or attempt to move there. And I feel like that's going to be the case. I feel like a Vulcan, it's going to be a very exciting fight. Ortega going to be looking for shots, probably going to t- tag Volkanovski with some good elbows, have Volkanovski hurt. Volkanovski probably going to have Ortega hurt at points. Probably a back and forth fight. But I feel like Volkanovski is going to ultimately have the intangible to be able to take the fight where he wants to dictate where the fight's on the ground or standing. Control that guard, land some shots, take some time off the clock, demoralize Ortega a little bit. But again, Ortega don't really get demoralized like that. But I feel like it'll be a very close, tight fight. But Volkanovski will be the one controlling the position and controlling where the battle takes place. Be one more active, landing more shots, scoring takedown, landing body shots from the takedowns, and uh, I said body shots in the guard. And this fight in a high paced fight, very close, but ultimately Volkanovski probably landing more shots, being more active, in controlling position. And that's what's going to get him the decision victory. So in this fight, I have Alexander Volkanovski via decision. And that- and so that concludes my five predictions for the four card of fights for UFC 266, Volkanovski versus Ortega. And as always, thanks for watching.